the cloud. Okay. So let's wait uh, two more minutes uh, and yeah. then uh, I'll let you. As I mentioned, I have a commitment. I have to leave at uh, 425. Okay, and then I will I will bring on uh, Dr. Khan, right? Yes, uh, I think uh, Ronda and Bob will be twenty two, uh, but we're yeah we're staying here. So Gary Hill, I have to uh, <coughs> uh, I have to do something for NSF, so I have to leave. Meter six again, Murat, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. meet at six. So how many people are there? Is it possible to tell? Here in this event, currently now nine. Oh, we'll see. It's a little bit a long day. We started at uh, yeah, yeah, seven yeah. thirty. So, uh, but the the good thing is that uh, this will be available in the video, uh, uh, sorry, YouTube no? channel. So, uh, so our goal is to have it later on. Uh, no, it's so. Uh, we are, I have a tutorial tomorrow. I'm very excited because of that aspect. So, so that it will be available in the right. ITD. So people hopefully will watch it more after after the fact. So it looks like conference is going well so far. Huh? Yeah, I think so. Uh, although 2,000 people registered, the keynote, the maximum we see in the keynote was 400, uh, and the sessions would are having around 30 to 60 people, depending on the ah, okay on the uh, top. Session. Yeah, but in the workshop we found we have six six of them at the same time, six sessions at the same ah, time. Sure, 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 sure. Because we wanted to <laughs> compress the day, uh, because it's like already uh, midnight in Europe and three four a.m. four a.m. in China. So like afternoon sessions has less people, for example, because yeah. China start dropping out. Uh, so that's the challenge of online conference. Yes, yes, because yeah, exactly, exactly. That is true. Uh, Murat, we have to admit. Uh... I'm, I'm admitting the people. Uh, oh, okay. When okay. I so I'll, I'll so let you... about. So Ronda will continue after I left. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll admit people. So let me start. Uh, thank you so much for joining the uh, this uh, presentation by the sponsor session. Uh, today's uh, UT Dallas is also a, a platinum sponsor for ICDE. And I invited my bus, we invited my bus and all bus, Gopal Gupta. Uh, that's probably uh, it, yeah. You want to carry me to yourself, please? I'm so very sorry, yes. Sorry, there was uh, some background noise. So I, we invited our bus, uh, Dr. Gopal Gupta, to give an overview of our department. Under his leadership, I think we more than doubled in the last 10 years in terms of size, funding, and every, every measurable aspect. So I'll let uh, Gopal to tell, to tell a little bit about our department and how maybe he achieved some of these accomplishments. Thank, Go ahead, Gopal, please. Thank, thank you, Murat, so much. And it's great to see that the conference is going well and uh, UTD team doing a great job. So yeah, that's wonderful, really. 2,000 registration and um, 400 attendees at any given time, given that people are all over the world. So what I'm going to do is give you, as Murat said, give a quick overview of, uh, so I can't say welcome to Dallas because many of you are not in Dallas. Uh, as I would have said, if I was giving a talk uh, physically, if I was physically present. So, um, so what I'm going to do is give you an overview of the computer science department uh, at UT Dallas. And my hope is that, so some of you are, uh, of course, uh, doing your PhDs. And so hopefully you'll apply for a faculty position here, be impressed enough. Or you may be a senior researcher and you have uh, uh, kids who are high school students who are looking for a place to go and uh, study computer science. Um, or um, if you are a master's student looking for a place to do a PhD. So hopefully you'll be impressed enough that, you know, no matter uh, what stage you are in, that, you know, there is some way of building a relationship with the computer science department and you can come and study here, do research or work here. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a brief history of University of Texas at Dallas. So UT Dallas is a young institution founded in 1969. So we actually turned 50 this academic year. And for a young institution, so it's, the founders of Texas Instruments played a major role in founding of the university. 
So even though we are a young institution as universities go, so universities, as you know, tend to be uh, old institutions. And in fact, um, I generally pose this as a quiz. Uh, what's the oldest non-secular university in the world? And uh, since I can't see everyone, so I'll just answer that question that happens to be University of Bologna in Italy. So, and that was, I think, something like 1200 or 1100 AD. I don't remember the exact time. So, so long time. So 50 years seems like an infant. But in these 50 years, we have done really well. And we were ranked number 21 in Times of London ranking of universities younger than 50. And in the US, we were number one in that category. But now, of course, we're going to get off that list as we turn 50. But that's not too bad. I mean, we got there because two universities ahead of us you know, dropped, out, dropped out of the list. So we became number one. Um, we'll find something else to brag about after this. We have about 30,000 students. We have grown fast. And uh, the university has grown fast and CS has a big role, has played a big role in this growth. We're actually the largest department on campus with 4,600 students. And the university is basically a geeky university kind of focused on computing, engineering, technology, science, and management. The computer science department was founded or computer science program in some shape or form was founded in the early 70s, as soon as the university is pretty much founded in 1969. And then in 1986, the School of Engineering was created. There was no engineering before 1986, only computer science. And then the university has kind of grown top down. It started with a PhD program. Uh, and at, there was a time when likes of Henry Fuchs uh, and Avi Silber Shahs were faculty members here. And then it added the master's program, the upper division undergraduate and lower division undergraduate. So it's kind of grown top down. And that has helped in attracting uh, top notch faculty members. So we grew rapidly in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and that growth continues. And the state of Texas has made significant investment, and that has paid off. And today, basically, our brand is that we produce graduates with deep, deep technical knowledge, and they basically get hired by, uh, by top companies in, uh, uh, of the world. Uh, so we're one of the largest departments in the country with 4,600 students, third largest to be precise. Um, only two other departments are larger than us. The largest department at UT Dallas. So every sixth student on campus is actually a computer science student. That's pretty amazing. Uh, so as I said, 4,600 students, 3,300 undergraduates, more than 1,000 masters. So yes, we have a very large master's program, highly competitive and very coveted program. Uh, 170, 180 PhD students, 50 plus tenure track faculty members, and so the model that we have adopted is that we have um, uh, we have a lot of teaching faculty also. Most of them have PhDs who teach who do bulk of the teaching. So that frees up time for faculty members to do tenure track faculty members to do research and teaching. And that also the added advantage is that the teaching faculty, instructional faculty, spend a lot of time. So they mostly they do most of the undergraduate teaching. They spend a lot of time mentoring students, and they really are. Uh, take take good care of the students. So tenure track faculty also teach undergraduate students, but by and large, their focus, as you would imagine, is on PhD students, uh, grant funding and publications and all those types of things. We offer bachelor's, master's, and PhD degree in computer science, software engineering. So all three degrees in computer science and software engineering and computer engineering, which is a joint program with EE and telecom engineering, but telecom engineering BS was dropped. And recent, recently, we started a bachelor's and master's in data science jointly with the math department. So that's kind of a degree, uh, you could call it as half computer science and half statistics. We, we keep our class size small by having this large faculty size. So even though all over the country and all over the world, computer science has become popular, and, and the way universities have coped is that they have class size of 100, 200, 300, 500, we've tried to keep the class size below 60. And that's possible only because we have this large set of instructional faculty. And that translates into a high quality of education. We graduate about 1,000 students each year between the undergraduates and graduate students. And that's more than 1% of US output because the whole country graduates about 70, 80,000 um, um, computer science graduates between across all degree programs. So we graduate about 1,000, which you know, translates to more than 1%. So it's pretty impressive that one department accounts for more than 1% of the output. Uh, we have world-renowned faculty, some of whom you have interacted, people like Dr. Bhavani and Morat and Dr. Khan and many others who are involved with this conference. 
We do lots and lots of uh, research as well, including, fund, including funded, funded research. And about eight to $10 million, uh, depending on the year on average, about $9 million in annual research expenditures. That puts us at about in the 30s rank in, uh, in the United States. We also do very well in most rankings. We're number 21 in LinkedIn ranking, which measures um, uh, how well uh, our graduates do with respect to being hired by top companies. We're number 44 in US News World Report global ranking of computer science departments. An interesting ranking that came out recently, which ranked us number five in undergraduate AI uh, uh, education. And that was by Best Value Colleges. Also on csrankings.org, we do very well. Number eight in natural language processing, number six in software engineering, and number six in embedded systems. And I think for cybersecurity, the last one year, we are number 14. So we do very well in these rankings as well. So as I tell everyone, we're not only one of the largest, but also one of the best. So here are the LinkedIn rankings where these were done only once in 2016 or something by LinkedIn. They measured what percentage of alumni of a, of a university take up uh, software development jobs with top companies and based on percentage of people uh, who find jobs. And we came in at number 21. So you can see very, we're in August company of uh, top notch departments like UPenn and Rice and only three schools from, this is for undergraduate, only three schools from Texas made it. And that was UT Dallas, Texas, uh, UT Austin and Rice. We also do, uh, we rank number, no, number 49 currently for 2019, 2020 in, uh, in csrankings.org. And again, you know, we are in August company of Rice and Davis. And so, so in the last 10, 15 years, a lot of investment has been made and it has paid off. And we have great faculty members, again, you know, some of whom are present at this conference and are organizing this conference. Uh, in individual areas, I think I already mentioned, we do very well, rank, rank number eight in NLP, number three in NLP and AI, number six in software engineering, uh, number three in software engineering and real-time systems, and number 49 overall, number five in the nation for undergraduate education in AI, and there we were just behind MIT, CMU, UC Berkeley, and Georgia Tech, so, and we actually have a phenomenal uh, 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 educational programs at the undergraduate level, uh, lots of options for people to choose from from among uh, AI courses, databases, cybersecurity. So students have lots and lots of options. With our SC program was also ranked number nine in the country by best computer science schools. There are all sorts of rankings. Anytime we rank high, you know, we we take we we, we run with it. These are some of our newest faculty members. So on the top row are the tenure track faculty members who joined last year. So you have Dr. Risha Bayer who works in machine learning and data science from the University of Washington and then three years at Microsoft Research, who joined uh, the, the AI and machine learning group last year. Dr. Feng Chen, uh, expert in data science, machine learning, and AI, comes from Virginia Tech. Uh, and he actually spent time at SUNY Albany and moved here as a, as a tenured associate professor last year. And Dr. Jessica Uyang and Dr. Kang Kum Ji, both are Columbia graduates, a PhD from Columbia, Dr. Uyang, uh, joined uh, as a faculty member in natural language processing uh, last fall. And Dr. G uh, joined, he was working at NEC labs and I think three or four years he was there and joined us last year. So thrilled to have him and these are great people. We also have a whole bunch of teaching faculty and all of them have a PhD uh, of all the five people, except for uh, Professor Scott Dollinger who only has a master's from Southern Methodist University. So out of our 40 plus uh, teaching faculty, nearly 40 have a PhD. So these are people who have significant industry experience possibly, and then they decided to go into, uh, got tired of their, uh, of their industry job and wanted to, they always had a passion for teaching and came back to the university to teach. So really have phenomenal faculty. In terms of research, we cover a wide variety of uh, areas. Uh, six broad areas to be precise, cybersecurity. We have one of the largest group and thanks to the leadership of Dr. Bhavani Thraisingam, she came in in 2004 and uh, built up uh, cybersecurity research at UT Dallas. Um, and now we have about, uh, about 12 uh, faculty, a dozen faculty members who work on it. And I'll talk more about cybersecurity research uh, later. Uh, we have also people working in computer systems and that's, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, graphics, uh, multimedia systems type of uh, work um, that uh, many of our faculty members do about 
half a dozen people. And in fact, that's one area where we are hiring. We wanted to hire three people, but um, the market is competitive. I think we managed to hire only two. Um, software engineering, that's programming in the large. Again, about eight, nine people working in that area. Um, uh, and we, as you, I mentioned earlier, uh, our software engineering research is highly ranked. Intelligent systems, again, a large group, AI, machine learning, um, uh, natural language processing, vision, and again, a large group. Computer science theory, we have one of the largest group in computational geometry in the country, about four people that has been built uh, over the last few years. Computer networking, Dallas, as some of you may know, is uh, a center for, uh, is a hotbed of uh, networking industry. Most of the big telecom companies are headquartered here. For example, AT&T and uh, American headquarters of Ericsson and a uh, few other European companies are here, Alcatel. And so obviously we have to have networking research. So we are of course, you know, focused on growth and the strategic area that we're focused on are, I mean, you could say these are all the buzzwords, but indeed uh, that's what the industry surrounding us is interested in. Uh, and that's where we want to build up as well. Machine learning, AI, data science, cybersecurity, software engineering, internet of things and software defined networks. And that's largely dictated by the, the, uh, uh, the, the research thrust that we have. Um, so BMW is located in an area which has about 3000 high tech companies. Thousand of these high tech companies are within five or 10 miles of campus. So we really are blessed with our location and we have a lot of industry collaboration as well. So we do a lot of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research, not just with the industry, but also with uh, uh, primarily with the healthcare sectors, hospitals and, uh, um, and uh, medical universities. So we have UT Southwestern uh, that is uh, uh, not too far from our campus, part of the UT system with whom we have uh, many ongoing projects. And the cybersecurity group works with the political science folks um, and has developed degree programs and funding funded projects uh, and all sorts of things. Um, we, again, we have wonderful faculty members, some of, you, some of whom you have been interacting with at the conference. 15 of our faculty members hold the prestigious NSF Career Award. And again, numerous best paper awards and academic honors. So Dr. Bhavani Thurai Singham just became fellow of the ACM and fellow of National Academy of Inventors. Zygmunt Haas, who's a networking faculty member, just became fellow of two European societies. Dr. Kevin Hamlin, I don't know if he's attending this conference or not. He actually just set the space flight simulation game world record. So he was playing some video game with his son or something, and then he figured out an, figured out an algorithm so that um, his, uh, performance uh, is now the best in that game. And I don't know anything about this space flight simulation program or simulation game. Uh, Dr. Lingming Zhang, who's a software uh, engineering faculty member, just won two ACM six soft distinguished paper awards, uh, very competitive. And then we just have Dr. Shi Wei, who's part uh, software engineering, part cybersecurity. Uh, the work that he did uh, with, between software engineering and cybersecurity research uh, earned him the uh, Paper of the Year Award by NSA. And I think this was published in CCS, Cybersecurity Conference. There are many such, many more such uh, honors that our faculty members have won. We really have incredible faculty. Um, the top four producer of computer science degrees uh, and our graduates, of course, computer science is a thriving field. So our graduates, even though we graduate thousand plus, they all have great jobs, great teaching. Again, our faculty members are great teachers and the way we have divided up um, teaching and research responsibilities, students actually get the get a great experience when it comes to uh, teaching. We also have a very diverse student body. We rank number 11 nationally number of women students, number 11 nationally number of Hispanic students, and number 14 nationally number of African American students. So actually UTD is a very diverse campus, uh, even among um, the undergraduates. Um, uh, so so uh, the, the uh, diversity of national origins is just incredible. So there are many uh, centers and institutes also that we have, and these are largely organized around the research thrust that we have. So you already probably know about the Cybersecurity Education and Research Institute, and that's the institute that's really organizing this conference directed by Dr. Thraisingham. We have the Human Language Technology Institute that organizes the activities around the uh, natural language processing and uh, AI machine learning. 
natural language processing mostly, Institute for Interactive and Spatial Computing. Uh, that's again a big group of faculty that this, so this institute brings people working in computational geometry, multimedia systems, graphics, uh, medical image processing so that they can all collaborate with the Institute for Data Analytics and then a whole bunch of NSF I, ICURC centers. These are industry university IUCRC centers, industry university cooperative research centers. There's one on net centric software, center for software testing and I perform center for assistive technology. So we also have a newly created center for machine learning research that is focused primarily on research, but we are, and we also have an industry facing applied AI research center directed by Dr. Doug DeGroote. Doug actually has uh, 30, maybe more 40 years of industry experience. And the idea is to go to companies and get projects for them in the area of AI. AI is a hard field, so we want to leverage that. And we also have another unique center, which is a center for computer science education and outreach. And it actually organizes summer camps for K-12 students uh, in the area um, uh, and reaches out to about 3,000 students, also organizes uh, after school summer camps for high school students in the area. And sometimes it does it remotely, so it can be outside of DFW area as well. And here we leverage our master's students who are desperately looking for jobs to actually teach K-12 students coding. So this works out really a win-win-win for everybody involved. Um, so you can see large number of centers and institutes and then here's a slide uh, on cybersecurity research and education at UT Dallas. This, that's the, um, so, so that's under the Cybersecurity um, Research and Education Institute. So cybersecurity, as we know, is a fast growing field and there's significant shortage of trained cybersecurity professional, especially here. And so we started in 2004 with the arrival of Dr. Bhavani Thuraisingam, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to build the cybersecurity program. In the last 15, 16 years, we've done really well. I think we might be the second or the third largest group, probably one of the best funded groups when it comes to cybersecurity research. Uh, we are NSA, Department of Homeland Security Center of Academic Excellence in cybersecurity education research, as well as the first university in Texas to receive the NSA cyber, cyber operations certification. And this group has been extremely successful with large number of projects in malware analysis, data privacy, cyber physical systems, security, adversarial machine learning, applying machine learning to cybersecurity, applying data science to cybersecurity. Um, so, so really incredible work that this group has done. Um, and we actually rank number 14 nationally if you look at the last one year ranking on csranking.org. In terms of education, we have a master's track within CS department in cybersecurity and a university-wide master's degree in cybersecurity uh, policy, actually, that's jointly with the School of uh, Economics, Public Policy, um, and essentially polit where political, the school where political science is taught. And, and this group has done incredibly well in terms of uh, imparting education. So it's gotten more than $15 million in the last 10 years uh, under the NSF Scholarship for Service Program to enhance cybersecurity education and develop research uh, capacity uh, at the university for cybersecurity. Um, so incredible work by the institute, by this institute. Uh, and also let me talk a little bit about Center for Applied AI. So this is the industry facing. So any of you who work for companies are looking for uh, doing projects in the area of AI or cybersecurity or any area pretty much where you want us to solve a problem, you need academics to solve a problem. We'll do that for you. And the interesting thing that UT Dallas has, which is very forward looking, is that under certain conditions, the company that sponsors a project owns the uh, IP. No, so IP always becomes a sticking point when uh, industry and universities work. But UT Dallas has a program whereby um, IP can be owned entirely by the university. And essentially, the lawyers get into uh, you know lockdown, and then nothing happens. The project doesn't go forward. And I tell everybody, 100% of zero is zero. So, so it's good to give away IP. And so once UTD adopted this policy last year, we created this center basically to capitalize on the popularity of AI. So there's an industry-facing center for doing applied AI work. 
we take on projects that are at the cutting edge uh, from companies that they are unable to do and they need r and d capability we leverage the expertise of our faculty members uh, and also the tools that we have built so for example we have tools for explainable ai that uh, are in house uh, and many other tools uh, ip is owned entirely by the company and we actually have our first large project that we are working on this center was started only last year uh, so it's been reasonably successful and there's actually a lot of interest among companies because everybody is excited about machine learning data science and looking at their data and learning something from it uh, so there is a long line of actually companies interested um, if it was not for covid 19 we probably have had more projects so uh, let me talk a little bit about undergraduate education and i'm coming towards the end of my talk so i will take another maybe 10 minutes so so that's the wise owl and the book ends and these are all the books that a student would study while getting an undergraduate degree here at ut dallas so we want to make sure that our students have strong foundation so uh, so a lot of thought has gone into designing our programs is what i want to basically the is the message i want to convey so what are the foundations uh, foundational aspect of computer science when it comes to undergraduate education is being able to so basically knowing programming well and knowing the mathematics of computer science which is discrete mathematics well so we actually have a programming sequence we require our students to take three classes most places have only two we require students to take two classes in discrete math most places have one so our students have very strong foundations and we want to have a strong finish so we have a capstone project course that every student has to do it's a team project so strong foundation strong finish and then basically build up strength in the middle and for strong beginning and strong end we have programs in place so we have something called the computer science mentor center where students can walk in and get help so basically we don't want to give we want to do everything we can for our students we don't want i don't want any student to come and say i failed or i did not succeed because the cs department did not provide me help <laughs> so all sorts of help is available including the cs mentor center especially in the beginning students have a hard time learning programming so they can walk in it's open pretty much from 10 am to 9 pm walk in and get help for these foundational things and also things like computer architecture then for the capstone project we have a program in place called ut design where we actually go to companies and get projects on which these students can work and it's a great experience for the student because it's a real world project and for companies it's great as well because they can hire and recruit as well as sometimes get things done and we have done something like 700 projects 800 projects in the last 10 years and each each one of them has been a success from startups to companies like ti companies have come and basically gotten things done that they have put into production and there are a whole bunch of other programs to support our program we have a cs freshman experience class we organize dinners for our freshman students so we can build a fe feeling of uh, belonging to a community we have an honors program we have a living learning community where all the students in computer science it's limited 160 or something students stay together in the dorms so basically they can create study groups and basically get they they uh, they're able to essentially prepare for classes and collaborate better they have a very strict attendance policy that class attendance and actually once we instituted this policy a few years ago we saw class performance go up so so we make sure that students are there in class they have industry internships thanks to our location undergraduate research and we have a lot of students club that students can be involved in programming competitions hackathon we even have a competitive programming team i'll talk about that in a little bit and k12 outreach where we involve our students so we really have a very well rounded uh, program uh, ex experience that the students get we organize about 100 events a semester outside of the classroom so not just in the classroom but also outside the classroom so truly speaking even though we are a public university and students are paying uh institution which is really low they're really getting a private school like experience because of all these things outside of the classroom and our teachers our instructional faculty who mentor them and who work with them so some of the student organizations we have are the acm of course probably one of the largest in the country with maybe 1000 plus students who are members the organizations like women who compute the blockchain club ai society virtual reality society and these groups are very active they meet every other week and sometimes there will be 200 people attending and the most interesting one for example is the computer security group 
And they sometimes I've been to the building on Saturday mornings and I have seen they have a lab of their own. I've seen standing room only on Saturday morning, which is quite incredible. Probably a competition or some talk or something. We organized a lot of hackathons as well. We had three hackathons last fall. Now, of course, we had two more this semester, but they all had to be canceled because of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. We have our MS program uh, in computer science, and we have a bunch of track. The most interesting ones are the intelligence system, which is focused on AI, another one on data science, and then, of course, the information assurance and cybersecurity track. So 11 courses, one can get a master's. Thesis can also be done. And we also have a dedicated master's program in software engineering. And here students have to take courses, six courses uh, that are dedicated to software engineering, things like requirement engineering, software architecture, testing, validation, project planning, etc. And this program is also available in the executive format. So actually we offer uh, this um, uh, on Friday evening so that those who are working and have experience. Uh, so experience is required to be in this program and we waive the GRE um, for such students. Of course, you have the PhD program. One has to finish a master's and then um, take the qualifying exam and then finish a dissertation. Uh, so I'll end with a few. So, so please visit our website and there are a lot of uh, news stories that you can uh, read. So I wanted to uh, just highlight some of the stories uh, from our news page. So if you go to cs.utdallas.edu slash news. So this is a story about uh, research by Dr. Kevin Hamlin. Uh, and he presented a paper at CCS, I think uh, just uh, this year, where basically where they have developed new tool for improving, essentially uh, it's to uh, attract um, uh, bad actors and study their behavior and use that study to uh, to and basically build better tools and have better defenses. And Dr. Hamlin has been working on it for a long time. Um, and we have a software engineering group that published six papers at the, uh, at the highly competitive International Conference of Software Engineering. I think this, the acceptances were sent maybe just a month ago or something. So that's why we have a story on that. And anytime we have, we, we publish a story. Then our students are really trained very well so last year, for example, 80 of our students were either hired as interns or as full-time uh, by Amazon and another uh, 20, 30 by Facebook. So our students actually do very well when it comes to, and in fact, our master students ranked, uh, the graduate students ranked number nine in the nation in terms of average money, average uh, dollars, uh, average salary that they are comp compensation that they receive. Again, this is a survey that is that people do when they publish. Um, so if you go to our news page and our website, you'll see lots and lots of this kind of information. And we have a wonder, we have a competitive programming team. So I don't know, many of you may not know that UT Dallas actually has a NCAA champion chess team. So they're always in the final four of chess uh, for the last 15 years. So that kind of motivated us and said, why can't we have a competitive programming team that we just, um, uh, fund and uh, prepare just like our chess team. So we started doing that 10 years, five or seven, eight, five, 10 years ago. And so this, this, so we actually have a coach an assistant coach and they practice just like a basketball team or something. And finally this year, they actually are going to go to the world finals. So going to the world finals of uh, the international computer programming competition is almost as hard as qualifying for the Olympics. I think they came in number 15 in the North American competition and 18 teams will go. So that was really incredible. So a lot of it is basically because we have been coaching them and working with them. And as I said, we don't have a basketball team or a football team on campus, but we have a chess team and a competitive programming team. So you can read the story on our web pages. And then Dr. Khan, who's gonna be presenting next, so story on him, he's a great researcher, databases, data science, machine learning. Um, so he just got an NIH grant uh, with uh, colleagues in um, political science from NI from, to improve uh, location information so that patients can be located quickly. Um, and then finally, Dr. Bhavani Thuraisingam, I think already mentioned, uh, she just was elected fellow of 
to technology organizations, namely the ACM. So she's a fellow of the ACM, she became last year and also was inducted into the National Academy of Inventors, just like, you know, kind of Hall of Fame. So, so we're really proud of uh, her achievement. And with that, I think uh, I am almost done with uh, all the information I had. So hopefully you learned something about the CS department, learned something new and motivated you to collaborate with our faculty members or if you're a student looking for a place to get your degree, you will come and join us. Or if you're getting your PhD, you will consider applying next year because we will have possibly at least half a dozen, maybe eight faculty positions. We actually had six faculty positions this year. I don't know with all this COVID-19 uncertainty, if we'll be able to fill all of them, but we're, we're, we have at least three filled. Uh, and uh, again, I encourage you to visit our website and go to cs.utdas.edu slash news, where we publish all the wonderful activities that uh, we organize. And anytime, please feel free to send me email if you need more information. And with that, uh, if there are any questions or comments, I will take those and I'll introduce Dr. Khan. Right, so uh, Gopal, that was really a very good overview and I really you know, wanted something like that so that you know, the ICD participants and maybe in the future when we put it on YouTube, they can you know, get to know about UT Dallas. Okay. And so for the second part, I thought it would be really nice to have a very technical talk. Yeah, I'm gonna that, yeah. If I may, uh, sorry for interrupting. Um, I would also like to thank, uh, you know, the, the Dr. Gupta for the support for ICD this year. I mean, it's really, really, truly appreciate your your your, your help and. Absolutely, anytime. I mean, we I I we always encourage uh, some conferences and bringing them to UTD. Wish it would have been on campus. Uh, then you all, have, all would have gotten a chance to visit Dallas and see the so campus. Yeah, so, but the next best thing you hear about uh, what UTD and Dallas are like. It's a no, Dr. Dr. Gupta just said. To Dallas. I mean, it's a, it's a very beautiful city. I've been there before. Right. And, like a, and Dimitrios, Dr. Dimitrios Monopoulos, he is the research program co chair with Murat and Sudarshan. Ah, okay. And uh, he and I go a very long, very long time. And wonderful. And great. So, that's a great conference. I mean, 2000 registrations. I mean, that's incredible. So, do you want to introduce uh, Dr. Yes, so Dr. Uh, we have about 24 minutes for him, yeah. Yes, okay, my great privilege to introduce Dr. Latifur Khan. So, Dr. Latifur Khan and I joined the university actually at the same time. I had moved from another place and Dr. Khan had just finished his PhD from University of Southern California uh, in the area of databases. And so, we started in fall of 2000 and Dr. Khan has done really, really well. Um, his, his research is focused on databases, data sciences, machine learning. Um, and I think his, he has a very high H index, 50 something. I can't remember now. Yeah. 50 plus minus five. But he's, 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 he's really a great researcher and a great colleague. And he's done some, and he's, his research has been supported by National Science Foundation, Department of Defense. And, and also he has collaborated with, uh, with the political science, uh, School of Political Science here, uh, and, and with, of course, uh, other faculty members, uh, and Dr. Bhavani and uh, Murat and all the other people. So, Dr. Khan, I hand it over to you. Sure. Right. He's, I just wanted to say he's also known as uh, Mr. Data Science. And he will be, he's also a supporter of women in data science, so I call him the ladies' man. <laughs> and so on Friday, he will be working with me the whole day on that. Anyway. Wonderful, wonderful. And he's also my neighbor. He's just uh, <laughs> uh, a quarter mile away from my home. Yeah, that's true. All right, go for it. So uh, you, you guys can see my screen? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Gupta and Professor Bhavani Thurasingham. So um, my talk will focus on mostly on the stream analytics work and its application. So these are the students who did a lot of work. So I just put their picture here. Uh, these are the PhD student who graduated. So the, the data stream means is a continuous flow of data. And you can think about sensor data, network traffic. These are examples of the data stream. So in this work, we focus on the classification problem, but in the context of stream. So keep in mind that in case of 
uh, why the stream classification is different from the traditional classification. There are some reasons. Uh, in a stream classification, you have to, when you build the model at the beginning, you need to continuously update the model. Otherwise, model will be obsolete and it will not do good job. So for example, in cybersecurity, just think about network traffic comes and it passes the firewall and the traffic, uh, <clears throat> once it passes the firewall, there is no guarantee that the traffic will be benign. It might be malicious. So we deploy some sort of classification model to identify incoming traffic, whether it's benign or malicious. If it is malicious, then we do further analysis. Now, <clears throat> the point here in the stream domain, if you build a model at the beginning of the year, and if you try to use the same model, even at the end of the year, so the model might be absolute. Attacker may change their attack pattern. Adversary may play, play the game. They may not stick with the same attack pattern. So in that case, this model may not be able to catch new types of attacks. So the requirement is, is in stream classification, you need to update the model. Now the question is, at which point you will update the model? One extreme is you can update the model <clears throat> very frequently at the, every hours or every minutes, then you may waste your resources because keep in mind that update the model means you have to provide the ground truth and human will involve in the loop to provide the ground truth, which might be, may not be feasible always. And furthermore, if there is no, uh, you don't need to update the model, but still you are updating the model. In that case, you are wasting also the computing resources. On the other extreme, if you do not update the model, if you update very infrequently the model, in that case, model may not perform that well. So now the question is, can we do some <clears throat> automated way to determine this is the right time to update the model? So the, for that, we develop novel technique uh, using unsupervised learning, fully unsupervised way we can say that this is the right time to update the model. How we do it? So one approach is when you do the prediction for the incoming traffic or incoming uh, testing instances, we will, have the, we will have the confidence values. And if you see in a window, the confidence value drops significantly over time, then we can say that model is not doing well. So we need to update the model. So this is a very basic idea we exploit here. And this uh, update the model, we develop a technique which is fully unsupervised that I told you. And in the stream, there are a couple of issues. The one issue is uh, <clears throat> what we call it concept drift, characteristics of data is changing uh, continuously. Say for example, if this is a let's say week one training data. We have a positive instance and negative instance. And this hyperplane or line separates the positive instance from the negative instance and week two data we get. And then in that case, the decision boundary is changing. The old decision boundary is no longer valid. If we use the uh, old decision boundary to classify the instances, then above this will be classified as a, a negative instance, but the correct classification boundary should be something like this. So in that case, blue points will be misclassified. So that tells you that we need to update the model. And but last but not least, we are the first who develop a concept evaluation. Uh, we have a patent, and this is a joint work between UIU University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign with Professor Jiwa Han group, uh, and Professor Bhavani was involved in that work also. So the idea here is uh, what we did, what we call it uh, concept evaluation or novel class. So let's say we train our model with a positive instance and negative instance. And when the test data comes, you will probably, in this case, this X are all cross, X or cross will be all uh, test data, we want to label it. So according to this model, some of them will be labeled as a positive, some of them will be labeled as a negative and so on. But in fact, this X should from a brand new class or emerging class. So in our technique, we can detect that using, uh, we can detect it as a novel class or in, we have developed some technique where we can detect on the fly that this incoming test data will form a brand new class or emerging class. And this is entirely different from the anomaly detection Anomaly detection, we assume that uh, uh, it will be a, everything will belong to one class. If there's significant difference from the, that existing class, it will be anomalous behavior or malicious. So uh, in our case, we do beyond that. In our case, novel class detection in the stream will work in a multi-class setting. So we may have positive class, negative class, and on top of it, we can detect that this will form a third new class. And this will be very useful for a security area in cybersecurity, just think about you have a zero day attack. You train your classifier with a benign instance 
and you train your classifier with a positive cl attack class say class a attack class a attack class b and um, so far you train with two attack class and one benign uh, class instances now test data comes with this uh, benign class and class a class b will be will be able to detect it but novel class instances are emerging which represents a class attack class c or attack c in that case existing technique in the past was not able uh, existing techniques were not able to do it we develop some novel technique where we can detect this uh, novel class what we call it zero day attack it will works very well so here this diagram demonstrates you more clearly so x axis represents the timeline y axis represents the class so you can see at the beginning we train with the three classes class 1 class 2 class 3 and then at time 400 class 4 instances come so if you train your model with only these three classes then class 4 instances will be identified either as a class three or class two or class one using the existing class but in, in your case uh, novel class detection in our case we can detect this as a brand new class or emerging class so that's our contribution so we have more work in this domain we did a lot of work over time uh, for the last five years so and now i want to talk about a little bit uh, new direction this uh, paper we published in worldwide web this uh, last year so the idea here is that uh, we want to extend this work in a multi-stream -cla classification domain uh, where the domain has a heterogeneity. What we mean, uh, let's say we have a Amazon reviews and uh, this focus on the environment, let's say on the movie domain, and then we want to test it on the, let's say book domain. So the review, we have a positive sentiment and negative sentiment, but that talks about with the movie reviews. Now we want to do it, uh, the testing, this is our source domain. You have the label data for the positive sentiment, negative sentiment, but focuses on the movie reviews. Now we want to do it for, let's say, book reviews where we want to do the positive sentiment, negative sentiment analysis and so on. So source and target domain, uh, they have a different uh, uh, things they're representing, but the, uh, the, in terms of the class, we have the same number of classes. So similarly for images, let's say we want to do, do a, a prediction on the image data set. In this case, let's say this represents zero digit class, this represents one digit class and so on. So these are all grayscale image and we want to test it on the colorful or a, a slightly different orientation of the images. So there, there we use the this domain adaptation work or the transfer learning. So the, and this work will be more um, appealing or more useful in, in, in case of cybersecurity. Let's say, just think about, you have a Windows environment, you have some uh, at system called traces, uh, some cybersecurity data, we can capture it. And then we have a label. So this trace represents benign, this trace represents malicious. Now we want to do it, uh, once you have the training data in the Windows environment, now we want to test it on the Linux environment. And Linux environment, we capture the system called traces. And then in this case, uh, we want to, uh, those capturing system called traces, we want to predict it whether it's benign or malicious. Now keep in mind that we have only the training data in the Windows environment, but we want to test it on the Linux environment. So the challenge is uh, the feature you will extract in the Windows environment that may not be exactly same in the Linux environment. Some feature may, may match, some feature may, may not match. So there is a heterogeneity in the feature space. And furthermore, characteristics of data may change, what we call it concept drift. So what we do in order to address that issue, these two domains, source and target. Source domain, we have the label data, and target domain, we don't have domain B in this case. So what do we do? We map these two domain data into a Latin space, and in the Latin space, we learn the, build a model using the label data we have regard to domain A, and when the test data comes from domain B, it will be transformed into the Latin space, and then we try to do the prediction. And that we tested it on the cybersecurity data, it works very well. And then one more, two more project I want to talk. And then, yeah, I think I have. So the, what we do, we do some distance learning uh, for the stream data case. So this work was uh, <clears throat> also published in SM Aldoid Web. So the idea here is, let's say we have this images. So you can see, in the original space, each of these image will be represented some feature vectors. So in the original uh, space, this image and these two images are very close. And this image, which represents the same similar class, but they will be far away from this image. So 
in the original <clears throat> space, when we represent those images as a point, you will see that same class objects will be far away and dissimilar class objects will be close together. So what do we do? We do a distance learning where the same class uh, points or the images will be close together and dissimilar class images will be far away. That's what we want to do using the distance learning. And so for that, what do we do? We do some, uh, so here in the original space, let's say X is an anchor points and X plus is a positive instance, which is the same with this class instance. And the X my, my this is a negative instance. So you can see here, this in the original space, these two dissimilar points, they're close. And uh, in the original space, uh, these two same class points will be far away. So that's a counterintuitive. So what we do in a distance learning, we try to make sure that uh, this same uh, class images or points will, be, will fall within some threshold or bound. And similarly, the dissimilar class points will be above some threshold or distance that we try to optimize it. And uh, so using that distance learning, we show that when you have a same person, these two uh, images represents the same object or same person using our uh, technique. Uh, actually, we can do it in these two images where, but here we cannot do it because these two images, our method fails and the traditional method also fails because these two images, I think uh, were taken 20 years apart. And uh, in this case, our model were able to identify that these two images represents different persons and so on. So these are the things we observe. And then we also do some work in a data science area. As Dr. Gupta said, we, I did work, we did work with a political scientist. This, wor and this, this work is funded by NSF from the social science division. So um, here the idea is this. Uh, we have a lot of, we crawl a lot of news articles uh, from the web and those news articles, we identify what are relevant to the political news. Once we identify these are political news, then we try to extract the metadata like event coding, source, target, actions. And we not only focus on English, we focus on the Spanish also at this point. And um, let me explain a little bit more details, what we call it event coding from the political news articles, we try to extract the event coding and this event coding will be stated like this. What is the source, source of the event and what action took place and what are the target and where the action or, or event took place. So for that, the point political science, they use some sort of dictionary or ontology called uh, cameo dictionary. So the, in that ontology, they have a root node and under root node, they have a four uh, high level concept, verbal conflict, material conflict, verbal cooperation, material cooperation, and so on. So, and each of this, uh, between, between two countries, let's say there is a, uh, like US and Venezuela, there were uh, verbal conflict going on for a while. So they may have some specific verbal conflict that this uh, particular class will be further categorized into this. Similarly, material conflict will be further categorized like this, so on. So this ontology has a multiple levels. So our goal, once we extract the articles from the web, then we want to parse those articles and then extract the metadata in this case or come up with the event coding. So in this case, from this given sentence, we want to identify what is the source, target and action. So here I'm saying uh, this, this text was taken a couple of years back. So at that time, before Boris Johnson, Theresa May was the uh, prime minister of the Europe, uh, Great Britain. So the, for this source will be GBR GOP, and then this talks about European Union, and the action is some sort of formal agreement. So using ontology from the text, we want to extract this type of data. Now the problem is, there are a bunch of problems we observe. One problem is we take the sentences, and keep in mind, we not only focus on English text, we also focus on Spanish text. Uh, so, uh, so we take those sentences, and try to match it with the cameo verb dictionary. Once it matches, then we'll go try to find with the source and target from the cameo actor dictionary. But there is a possibility that uh, some of the verbs we cannot find in the verb dictionary, that's one possibility, or we may find the verb dictionary, but the actor, uh, actor like source and target may not be found. 
So what we observe in our case, say for example, when President Trump was elected uh, as a president in, in 2016, um, he, became, he came into power. At that time, he was not listed in the uh, political actor dictionary as a as a as an actor. So he was not listed there as an as a political actor. He was listed there as a businessman. So using our tool, we try to recommend new political actors. So the idea is very simple. We crawl a bunch of news articles and then parse those news articles and see that the verb action is found, but the sum of the actors do not match with the existing dictionary. Uh, dictionary. So then if we see that that particular entity comes frequently in a particular, in each window, window means uh, week one data, week two data and so on. And if it comes, Donald Trump was mentioned frequently, and so on. So we can recommend Donald Trump as a political actor. And then we have to determine the political actor role also. So for example, for Donald Trump, we need to determine what role he will play. So we observed when the Donald Trump was mentioned, he was mentioned with the other US, uh, other, other existing entities where their role is like US elite, US gov and so on. So that way we propagate uh, Donald Trump role uh, you, we propagate this role to Donald Trump role and so on. And uh, another things we did, uh, we, uh, we have a lo lot of news articles and then we try to determine the focus location. And focus locations is easy to find. There are a lot of tools that exist, uh, but we need to find the primary focus locations. So for example, this uh, raw text in English that talks about uh, something happens in Nigeria, but we need to find that uh, primary focus location will be this. And uh, so many locations are mentioned there. So our goal is to, uh, once we using Stanford Core NLP, we identify uh, possible locations, and then we need to determine which location will be the focus location. So for that, we treat the problem as a classification problem. And we test, we develop some techniques that will work. Uh, it will take the training data in, in English and test it on the Spanish text or vice versa. So these are the things we did. And last but not least, uh, we I did some work. We did some work in a uh, encrypted in a in a cybersecurity area. What we call it um, traffic a website fingerprinting. So here the idea is this, um, let's say you have client wants to access certain website and as an attacker, we are going to uh, develop some tools to identify what website client is accessing. But again, keep in mind that as an attacker, we cannot see the uh, traffic because the client is very smart. They're using the Tor or um, HTTPS network. So the traffic will be, as an attacker, we can only see encrypted traffic. So from there, our goal is to, from the attacker perspective, to identify what website client is accessing. That we call it website fingerprinting. And uh, this work is to identify the website and it can be used in a good ways or bad ways. It can be used bad ways. If the attacker is a is authoritarian government, then they can identify their client like a journalist, activist, and bloggers, identify that they're accessing particular website, the government doesn't like it, then they can prosecute them. Or it can be used in good ways if you can identify a bad citizen who is doing some bad activities, you can identify using these tools. So, but again, when you do the classification, we not focus on uh, all over the world because on the World Wide Web, there is a billions of websites. We have we only focus on few websites. That is, we call it monitored website. The challenge is, uh, is a data will be encrypted. So this is one problem. And while attacker can see only the packet size in byte and packet time, so we develop some novel feature extraction technique over the encrypted data. So there we consider the relationship among sequence of packets in opposite direction. And we focus on HTTPS and the Tor network. And we consider the open world setting. In, in that case, the idea here is we focus on the client may access, go to any website, but we only target few websites, five or 10 websites we want to monitor whether the client is accessing or not. And then later, we also develop some defense mechanism where we can overcome the adversary's attack. And what we observe in this work, website fingerprinting, in a short uh, notice, I can say 
when it, this is, we extract the features then from the training data and then we build a model, uh, some classifier, and then we try to do the prediction. So what we observe, if we do not update the model continuously, we observe that the model performance degrade over time. So that's why we, it shows that we need to update the model periodically. That's the thing we did so far. So uh, that's, that's it. I want to stop here and if you have any question. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khan. And yes. so um, if there are any questions, we will be, you know, happy to, to Dr. Khan will be happy to answer the questions. It's, um, right, so I, I just wanted to ask about uh, one question I have for the COVID-19, uh, COVID uh, sure. because we're almost time, one more minute left. So what are, what are some of the work that you are doing? Very briefly, if you can answer in one minute and then, you know, they can email you for other questions. Yes, yeah, so with regard to COVID-19, we are crawling a bunch of uh, tweets that are related to the COVID-19. Yes. And uh, that work might be relevant to database world. Uh, so we crawl a lot of news articles uh, from uh, all over the world that not on the Twitter messages not only focus on English, it also focus on Chinese language. China has a different equivalent product for the Twitter yeah. called Weibo. So we crawl, crawl those uh, messages and then identify that which one is relevant to the COVID-19 or, or is there any important message they convey like symptoms or some medications they're discussing. So we try to extract those inf useful information and uh, using some sort of classification uh, from the identify the, whether the message should be re relevant to us or not. Once we identify relevant messages, then we try to translate it using Google Translator and show to the users. I think that tool might be very useful for um, mankind. And, uh, and we are uh, focusing, as I said, not only in English, we're focusing on the Spanish text also and do some sentiment analysis that might be useful to identify okay. whether people are interested about social uh, distancing or not, those type of things. That's good. Thank you so much. And let, let's give both of them a hand, uh, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Khan. And please uh, make sure that tomorrow morning, uh, I know it's late, especially for you know, those in Pacific Asia as well as in Europe. Tomorrow morning, Friday morning, May 20, sorry, April 23rd, we start at seven o'clock and the speaker is going to be our third and final large sponsor. So uh, we had the gold sponsor this morning, Alibaba, and platinum sponsor this evening. And tomorrow morning, we'll have the gold sponsor, Qatar Computing Research Institute. And that's going to be at seven o'clock from seven to eight. And then 8.30, we start our keynote session for the morning. So please be there bright and early. When I say these times, all the times are in, all the times are in central daylight time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you and good night.